Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio, podcast, and television show. I'm your host, Life Coach Renee Young, and sitting in the guest chair today is Kate Manser. She's a spiritual teacher and the author of You Might Die Tomorrow. Beautiful topic. So Kate and I today are going to be talking on the topic, how to live like you might die tomorrow. And you know something? That has been the way I live my life. We're, we're gonna we're just highlight, <clears throat> excuse me, we're just highlighting it today, but you really should live like you're gonna die tomorrow because what does the Bible say? Tomorrow's not promised. And you know that people leave their house in the morning and never come back in the afternoon. So stick around until the end. Kate is going to basically share with us how you can make this a life practice. Welcome, Kate. Hello, Myrna. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. All right. Um, so let me give you a brief introduction. Not sure why my throat has gone crazy all of a sudden. <clears throat> um, Kate Manser helps humankind feel more alive. She's a visionary creator and spiritual teacher whose works include speaking, books, large scale sculpture, and mindfulness experiences. Kate's book, You Might Die Tomorrow, has sold thousands of copies. Her art has been shown at New York Fashion Week, and she has spoken at Facebook headquarters. Most of all, Kate revels in the wild and wonderful experience of being alive. And she invites everyone she meets to come along on the journey with her. How wonderful, how beautiful. Yes, don't wait, live every day that it's your last. All right, so let's dive right into this very exciting conversation. Kate, hey, can you share your personal awakening story and why you created the YMDT movement, which is You Might Die Tomorrow movement? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, several years ago, I was like everyone else or like a lot of people, I believe, where... I didn't really think about death. Like I knew I was going to die someday in the future, but it was like, oh, it's going to be when I'm 99. I don't need to worry about that. And then just before I turned 30, I'm uh, 30, turning 39 this year. But so just before I turned 30, uh, in the span of six months, I had three friends die in just unexpected, unrelated events. And that really threw me for a loop because the first one and then the second one and then the third one all in the span of six months it really made me fear for my life so that was not the moment of my awakening that was the moment when I really kind of felt the safety of my life fall away and I really became afraid that I could die at any moment so instead of thinking that death was when I was 99 I did the complete opposite which was thinking that death was hiding out for me around every corner and on every highway overpass and and I spent a year and so you might be a listener some people listening who have had bouts with death anxiety where you've gone through a period of hypochondria or worrying about death all the time or obsessing about death and existential questions and that's what I did and during that time I became afraid to do pretty much anything I was afraid to go and uh, enjoy my life I was afraid to almost leave the house I had trouble sleeping and mm -hmm. it was really just this fear that um, that I could go at any moment. And that, that makes my awakening that much more remarkable because what popped me out of that deep death anxiety, other than the fact that in that time, I also made a few changes to my life. I got divorced and got out of a challenging relationship was that I had a fourth friend of mine pass away. And uh, he was a guy that I just really looked up to. He was so vivacious and adventurous. We were colleagues at Google, actually. And he lived the life that I dreamed of. While I was afraid and living in my house and, and afraid to do anything, Dan was out there climbing literal and figurative mountains and having adventures and playing pranks on his friends and just really enjoying life. And so uh, in April 2015, when he was attempting to sub summit Mount Everest, that was when the Nepal earthquake struck and he was killed in an avalanche. And, you know, you might have thought that that would send me deeper into death anxiety, but actually it did the opposite. It made me realize that whether I'm afraid in my house or whether I'm living an amazing life like Dan, that 
we're all going to die and none of us really know when. And I can do and choose to put my time and energy, our precious resources that we all have, I can choose to put that into trying not to die or I can choose to put that precious time and energy into living. And so the last thing I'll say before I pause here is that what was the scariest thing for me, the idea that I might die tomorrow, after that, it became the most motivating, inspiring, and clarity-inducing mantra of my life. It went from, oh my gosh, I might die tomorrow, to, oh, I might die tomorrow. That puts everything in perspective. It gives me yeah. clarity. It gives me motivation, urgency. It makes yeah. me want to love bigger and put my inhibitions to the side. And yeah. uh, and so I'll pause there. I know that was a, a lot to take in, but uh, you know that was almost 10 years ago. And I'm not walking on clouds every day because that's not how awakenings work. I think you know that. <laughs> we have to continue to go through the muck, but my life is forever changed. And, and I invite you to use death as a way to come alive. That's what I invite you to do today. Yeah, that's that's a good story. I mean, uh, I mean, the story had so many different nuggets in it. Yes, you know, we all think. <laughs> I went to a psychic a long time ago and she read my palms and told me I'm going to die at 96. But I know very well, that <laughs> I know very well that, that that's not real. That's not necessarily true. And, you know, I live my life where, yes, you know that when you, you kiss your husband in the morning, I said, I'm, I'm aware of it. I'm conscious of it, maybe because I read the Bible and it says that there, but I understand where you're coming from because my daughter went through a very traumatic experience where how fi her fiance committed suicide. And she was in that same death anxiety place where you were with me, you know, um, if she didn't hear from me and she didn't whatever, she kept worrying that I might die. You know what I mean? Not necessarily I'm going to kill myself, but I might die and I'm the only thing she has left kind of thing. So, I mean, uh, if she calls my phone and, and I don't answer it, she was like in a panic kind of thing. So I under I understand where, where that part is coming from. But that is such a beautiful thing where you're fearing that you're going to die to accepting tomorrow is not promised that let me make the most of today because I might not have a tomorrow. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to live your life. Like I said, I do that too. Um, and, and it's, and it was my family because there's, there's certain things you need to, you want to be in place when you die. Right. So I hear all these people that are dying without a will and they're dying without doing this. And I'm thinking some people that are sick <laughs> or, are old and, and and they still don't think that they're gonna die tomorrow and, and then they die and, and they don't and they don't have any of those things in place. So I know that your journey, and I use the word personal awakening, um, that was one part of it. But the other part of it that I absolutely love because I'm a meditator and one of my goals was to go to India and to um go into an ashram. It's you know. I'm thinking I'm going to go to one right here because Sad Guru's got a place in the U.S. <laughs> and I'm thinking that to, to, this year I'm going to go there. But I love the I love the Indian spirituality and what they bring to the table. And I understand that part of your awakening journey was an experience at Plum Village, which is Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery in France. So how did meditation allow you to embrace the fact that you might die tomorrow and you're okay with it? <laughs> well, what happened after the awakening that I had in 2015 after Dan died and, and it kind of was a light bulb moment, but I don't want you guys to believe that like this light bulb went off and I understood everything, even though I did have a revelation on that day and around that time, like more was being revealed to me as I went and I pursued that, right? A lot of times we get calls from our intuition and we ignore them, but we, if we don't, if we listen to our intuition and we listen to God, 
God continues to give us more morsels and more open more curtains for us to see. And so initially when I, you know, had this revelation, oh, you might die tomorrow. This is the most motivating, clarity inducing. And I'll just a side note is like a lot of what we struggle in life, which is feeling stuck, feeling like we're on autopilot, feeling like we don't have motivation, feeling like we're imposters, feeling like we're held back by inhibition and fear, feeling like we don't know what our priorities are. Thinking about death solves like almost all of that, right? So, so that's this key. So, what I did was I was like, I, I had this knowing that I needed to quit my job at Google and travel around the world. I don't know, you know, at, at me at 30 years old, that was my highest expression of living like I might die tomorrow. So I did it. It was it was very scary and also amazing. And I ended up leaving Google and I flew and I and I was going to travel for one year, ended up uh, extending it out to almost two years, including a road trip around the U.S. in my car with my dog. And it was amazing. I felt so alive. It was really a spiritual journey. I did go to India and I went to a 30 day yoga teacher training. I went to, you know, a retreat in Bali. I went to a monastery in Japan. It was really just me exploring spirituality and who I was. And so when I ran out of money and I got back to the U.S., I thought that I was the spiritual awakened guru, right? And uh, so when I came back, I had to get another corporate job. I got an apartment. I had to get a car, you know, just coming back to society. Well, I did not readjust like an awakened, enlightened guru uh, (laughs) at all. I got frustrated. I got mad. I got stressed. I got anxious. I was mad about traffic and the job and and everything. And so, you know, what I realized is like, it's really easy to feel alive when you're like walking through the streets of Japan and you're taking a sabbatical from work. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometime after that, I uh, went through a a challenging period in my life. It was some personal uh, life changes, including a breakup. And I just knew that I needed to reignite my light. And so I searched all around to try to find an affordable, uh, uh, meditation retreat that also called to me spiritually. And I found Plum Village and which is, I didn't really know who Thich Nhat Hanh was at the time. And I went to Plum Village in France, this amazing, very pastoral monastery in the countryside of France, where you essentially Mm -hmm. live like a nun or a monk for the time that you're there with other nuns and monks. And it was there that we were exposed, of course, to Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, which are all about appreciating our breath and appreciating being alive. And it was there that I got to experience walking meditation for the first time. And Thich Nhat Hanh's particular style of walking meditation is essentially like this. You walk from point A to point B, maybe like a small hiking trail or even around your house or a neighborhood. And you just walk and you feel your feet on the ground and you look at the sky and you feel the air on your skin. And you're just so deep in the present moment. That absolutely changed my life because what I realized through that practice after I left that retreat was that, like I said, it's easy to feel alive when you're traveling around the world and doing all these exciting things, but that the real quest of my life is learning how to feel alive on any ordinary day while I'm standing at the sink doing the dishes. That's what being alive is really about. And yes, I think most good lives will have moments of risk or big, big change, right? Like quitting a job or changing a relationship or starting a business or having a child. But really most of our life is made up of these small moments and learning to feel alive in those moments. Uh, And so to me, that's what meditation is. I, yes, I'm a practitioner of meditation and I'm some of the meditation that I teach is the kind where you sit down on the ground and you close your eyes and right. But walking meditation is my actual specialty because to me, I believe that walking meditation, like I just described, trains us to see life and to feel life instead of living on autopilot, which we all do. And the last little story that I'll share here on this is at Plum Village, They what they do is every 15 minutes, one of the nuns or the monks will go gong this big bell. And so every 15 minutes you hear gong. And whenever you hear that, you're meant to stop, take a breath, look around, and then just move on with whatever you're doing. So they have an app, Plum Village. You can download it. It's free. And you can actually program that. It's called the Mindfulness Bell. 
to go off on your phone every 15 minutes or 30 minutes or hour. So I was all excited when I got back from Plum Village. I'm going to continue with my mindfulness bell. So I set it up on my phone to ding every hour. And at one point, I'll never forget, my phone went ding. And I looked up and I took my breath and I was in Target. And I had like no idea even how I got there. I was just doing my errands and you know how we get, you know, in like whatever we've got going on in the day and I have to do this and I have to do that. <laughs> and it was like, oh, like it's so easy. Even after a meditation retreat, we just get caught up in the autopilot. But I think one of the quests of our life, like I said, is learning how to feel alive and learning how to experience the wonder and beauty of life and God's creation on any ordinary day. And I like to call those our alive moments. <laughs> Yes. Wow. We went around the world there. So that's beautiful. So let me see. Um, yes. Um, Tink Nhat Hans. I, um, I'm a meditator, but I usually like guided meditation. I mean, I tried one time to just sit on the cushion and uh, with my own thoughts, non thoughts or whatever, but that didn't work for me. So I like guided meditation. So I go on YouTube and I have a couple of guided meditations by Thich Nhat Hans, And I think I'm also, not I think, um, I, uh, he's got a book out and I've been, I've been reading that book. So I understand about, about, uh, you know, what his ministry is and all that. Now, as far as the walking meditation is really interesting, but I walk a 5k in the park every day. And there's a certain part in the park where it is, it's, I call it the sanctuary, but it's 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 wooded area and they just um, put a trail through it. And whenever I'm in there, that's what I do. I do a walking meditation. I pray, I talk to God, I'm aware of the breeze, I'm aware of the trees and all that. And and that is what fills me up. I mean, I, I was at this conference the other day and the guy was talking about what fills your tank. And I will tell you, my tank is usually always full because of the fact that I meditate and the fact that I walk in the park and I commune with nature every single day. And of course, my personal relationships fill my tank. But yes, um, so that is amazing. And even this morning while I was meditating, because a lot of times I meditate, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time I meditate um, in bed before I wake up. And this morning, I was actually coming to tears about the fact that I have breath in my body, that my soul is still in my body. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And at one other point, I was just reading, it's really interesting. I picked up this book that is called Poverty Mindset, How to Get Rid of a Poverty Mindset. And this guy is talking about so many important things. And one of the things he said is that your breath is so important that you should every hour remind yourself to take a deep breath. So you know what? I am going to download that app and I am going to remind myself to take a breath, a deep cleansing breath every hour. I'm also going to send it to my sister because she is the doing, doing, doing person. <laughs> Yeah, you never know where we might find ourselves when we're on autopilot, right? It's like, oh, okay, I'm driving, or oh, I'm in, I'm in taking out the trash. It's like, yeah, but Thich Nhat Hanh really talks about how, you know, just like you said, how any of these actions, taking out the trash can be this act of reverence. And I yes. like, I, I invite you to think, you, Myrna, me, and all the listeners, what is something in your life that when you do it, it is essentially a meditation for you. It is a moment of transcendence. It's a moment of peace. It's a moment where time maybe slows down. Your problems gently lift from your shoulders. You know, I've asked hundreds of people this question over the years, and I've gotten everything from doing dishes, vacuuming. Some people even said working, running is a common one, yeah. biking. A lot of yeah. people say playing music or painting. So think yes. about that right now. What is it in your life that when you do it, that is your moment of aliveness. And I would, would like you to consider that your meditation and consider that your flow and that time that you can enter in that rever reverence. And the more that we do those activities, we're training our brain to live in that state. And what you will find is that as your brain neuroplastically adapts to that state while you're painting or whatever your, your flow meditation, alive meditation is, 
that that mindset will begin to trickle out more into your everyday life. And you'll find that you're more reverent when you're not doing those things. And when you're doing something that maybe you, you found used to find frustrating or used yes, to yeah. just be an ordinary activity. And so there's benefit to, to you doing those. Yes. Well, yeah. Meditation. One of the byproducts of meditation is that you don't fly off the handle. You're calm. You're peaceful. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? You know, I was talking to my husband the other day. We were having a, a slight uh, heated discussion. And I said to him, listen here. I mean, I look after my mental health. <laughs> you know what I mean? Walking in the park, uh, meditation. I don't fly off the handle. You know what I mean? Uh, very often because of that. Yes, it, it just calms you down. You're right. It, it, it seeps into other areas of your life. So yes. Yeah. So that's amazing. All right. So um, one of the questions I have here is um, talking about life events. You I mean, you went through, you know, your friends and, and all the things that happened to you, but um, uh, you say that divorce, loss, alco alcoholism, debt, anxiety, depression, you know, these are all life events. So when somebody's going through a life event like that, how do you teach them, whether it's through meditation or whether it's through your book, to um to live for tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, well, and we've all gone through these things. So, yeah, I mean, in my life. Uh, just as you said, I've, I've, uh, uh, had alcoholism both in my family and in myself. I've, uh, obviously had loss. Many young people and other friends and family members have died often unexpectedly. Uh, you know, I've been married and divorced and, uh, myriad other struggles that we all share, right? I'm not, I'm not special in my struggle, but two things that I want to share that might help you on your journey with your own struggles. And the first one is that a couple of years ago, uh, I had the realization, and this was, I had already been, you know, I had already written the book of You Might Die Tomorrow. I had been been blogging and I had had this movement, you know, people buy the t-shirts that say You Might Die Tomorrow and the tote bags and the, and the mugs, right? So I had been living this like thing about live like you might die tomorrow. And I always talk about how much I love life. And I realized a few years ago when I was in depression in 2022, I was in the deepest depression of my adult life. And at some point in that time, I realized that I was a fraud or I had been kind of a fraud. And here's how I had been a fraud. Because for years I had been talking about how much I love life. But in depression, in shadow, in challenge, all I wanted to do was get out. Get, get me out of here. I can't feel this. This is too, too painful. And so if I say I love life, but I only love the part of life that's fun and shiny and full of flowers and blue skies, then I don't really love life. I love easy life. I love good life. And that's not actually a true representation of what life is. What life is, is this full, full, full spectrum of challenge, pain, shadow, to contentment, to being bored, to being happy, to being joyful, bliss, and everything in between. And so for me, that moment when I realized that if I really want to say that I love life, I need to begin the process of learning to love all of life. And as Ram Das, Ram das says, we need to learn to love our pain. And that's not easy. And I haven't 100% figured it out, but I've absolutely come pretty far along that, along that spectrum of becoming less of a fraud <laughs> when I say I love life because now I really have an appreciation for my pain and I have an appreciation for knowing that it is a part of a full and rich life and that there's reason for it, that we learn from it. God gives it to us. And, uh, and so I encourage you to develop an appreciation or at least a reverence for your pain and to understand that number one, it's part of life and number two, it doesn't last forever it's, it's transit transitory, just like everything else. Happiness is transitory. Pain is transitory. And even when we're in those deep, dark moments, like I was in 2022, when there were times that I thought I would never get to the light at the end of that tunnel, I would remind myself, Kate, nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. And so that's the first seed that I'll plant for you, uh, as far as getting through struggle. And the second one is when I go through things and now that, you know, we, me, like you, we've gone through so many different challenging experiences. We've overcome things. We've been on the bathroom floor crying about things. 
when I like to think about that, I picture Earth. Okay. And I picture all the people on our earth, on our globe. Right. And, and I think about all the people that like me have also gone through divorce and the pain of divorce. Uh, I think about all the people that have also gone through sexual assault. I think of all the people who have also had parents who are alcoholics or have gone through alcoholism in their own lives. And every time I think about that, I think about all the people and they're all little like Christmas lights. And so when I think about all the alcoholics or all the people that have had sexual assault or all the people that have had divorce, all those Christmas lights go on. And I realize that I can empathize with all of those people in a way that had I not gone through those things, I would not be able to emphasize, empathize with them. They can understand me and I can understand them in a way that someone who hasn't gone through these things would never be able to understand. And so I share, just like you share, a connection with all, all of the people that have gone through those things. And every time we experience a new challenge or a new setback, we get more little Christmas lights that light up and connect us with all the other people around the world. And this helps us to remember that we are not alone and that there is value in connecting and feeling a connection with others through the challenges that we've gone through. And, um, and that we might meet one of those people one day who's gone through sexual assault or alcoholism or depression or suicidal thoughts or whatever. And we can, we can be godlike for them and listen to them and open our hearts in a way that had we not experienced that, we, uh, we wouldn't truly be able to understand or be there for them in that really special way. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, one of the things that I always say to you, and it, it's very hard to tell yourself when you're in a moment. Um, and that, that came from another master. I don't remember his name right now, which this too shall pass. So, um, and the scripture also said that, you know, uh, the darkest part of the night is before dawn. So um, yes, people have got to, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a good um, way to think when you are in a dark place. Um uh, you talk about not being not sure if you're going to get to the to the light is that everything is temporary this life is temporary you know the pain the darkness the happiness people don't even understand that people don't understand that happiness is fleeting you know you're happy one day and the next day you're not people always think that hey you know i'm happy and it's gonna last forever or i'm sad and it's gonna last forever but yes, this too shall pass. So that's a good way to um, to embrace challenges. Is that yes, um, uh, this too this too shall pass, or nothing lasts forever. Whatever way you wanna wanna you know whatever way you wanna phrase that. That's amazing. All right, now you also have um, uh, something that you do. I'm not sure if it's part of your um, your YMDT movement. And it's called the death bed gut check. Talk to us about that. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great time, I think, uh, to share the death bed gut check as well, which is a tool that can help you uh, beat decision paralysis, be overthinking and to get unstuck. Um, so I'll share that in a moment. But one thing I think is important to talk about is how, you know, when I began this journey with this with working with this idea of death and mortality and working with the you might die tomorrow movement at first i was really focused in on the idea that that death is the key right like thinking about mortality it can solve so many things and and i still believe that's actually true but after i got out of plum village and i really started working with this notion of feeling alive i realized that death i i really care more about feeling alive like i i like the idea of death and i think death is like absolutely key to living in a live life but that there's so many ways to feel alive and death is just one way to get there right like a Thich Nhat han style meditation or a meditation walk like you said you do in your sanctuary every morning that's a way to feel alive to go out of our comfort zone that's a way to feel alive to vulnerably share our love that's a way to feel alive like there's infinite ways to feel alive and i care most about feeling alive and living our best life death is just one way to get there and the deathbed gut check is something that i came up with some years ago uh, working with the you might die tomorrow movement where so I would like you to think about a decision that maybe you've been sort of bopping back and forth on in your life or you've been a little stuck on. It could maybe be something you uh, 
you know, a life change that you're thinking about making that you're not sure if you should, or maybe there's a habit in your life that you want to start that you've been fe feeling stuck on. Maybe there's a habit in your life that you want to stop that you have been feeling stuck on whether you should stop. And we're going to apply the deathbed gut check to that. So once you have your, your, your question or your situation that you want to work with, now I invite you to imagine yourself on your deathbed. You can close your eyes if you'd like. This will only take about 30 seconds, but um, it's, a, it's a peaceful deathbed. It's beautiful in this vision. And um, you're looking back over your life and you're looking back over this time of your life where you're struggling with this decision. So you're at the end of your life and nothing really matters as much anymore. Accolades don't matter. Money doesn't really matter. You know, your priorities seem to come to the surface, like, like the cream to the top of the cup. And you imagine yourself having chosen option A in this situation that you're struggling with. And you observe how you feel in your gut from the perspective of your deathbed at the end of your life. And maybe you get a feeling. Maybe as if you're, you're imagining yourself having chosen option A and what might come after that, you feel a sense of like lightness of like, oh, yes, this is exciting. This is... Or maybe you feel like a heaviness, sort of a pit, like option A, option A doesn't really feel good. And if you'd like, you can repeat this same exercise looking at option B or option C if you need to. But usually for me, I am able to figure it out really quickly. And so I began practicing that. And at first it was like, okay, I'll sit for 30 seconds and close my eyes. But as I began practicing it more and more and applying it to the situations of my life, it got so that I could bop to that deathbed gut check perspective in my mind in, in a moment, right? And I can get that sense of clarity, like, you know, pushed away from all of the, the stuff that we get trapped in in our everyday life. And so that is the deathbed gut check, which is where... Uh, you know, in the words of Steve Jobs, uh, in his com one of his commencement speeches, he said, remembering that I will be dead soon is the best thing I have ever found to help me make the tough choices in life. Because at the end of life, all things fade away, pride, fear of embarrassment and failure. And what is left is what truly matters. And that is what the deathbed gut check is based on is it's so easy to get caught up with so many things in life and get distracted and competing priorities. And my mom wants me to do this. And my boss wants me to do this. And I'm stressed. The deathbed gut check just says, Hey, when you have your clearest view of your priorities and what matters, what do you choose? And, um, it's a choice that's, it's a tool that's helped me make so many big choices in my life. And, and I share it with you today to use it to, decide what brand of yogurt to purchase or really big, big decisions about whether to maybe stop drinking or leave or start a marriage or have kids or, you know, on and on. Yes. Those are big. I like that. I have never, um, I've never heard it, this particular, um, tool, um, uh, you know, spoken about in, 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 in your specific way of doing it, but I love it because, um, just recently, I was mediating um, a relationship that's kind of between a mother and a daughter that, you know, they're all focusing on the things. And one of the things, you know, that I, we haven't actually sat down yet, we were doing over the phone. One person is talking about what makes them, what hurts them. And the other person is talking about what hurts them. And, and we're going to come together. And one of the things I was going to do when I come together is is almost the same thing that you were talking about here. What is important to you in life? You know, what is, I mean, I'm not calling it a, 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 a deathbed gut check, but I'm calling, you know, another word for it is a legacy. Um, what is important to you in, a, in relationships? And if you can, I would tell you, if those two people were looking at your deathbed gut check when they're deciding that, you know, they're going to get upset over these little trivial things that, you know, that are, that are not important. Yeah. At the, at the end of your life, are those things going to matter? And a lot of people talk about that. Um, like, you know, you, there's so many ways to get to the same message. You know, some people talk about, Hey, you know what? Um, I've never seen anyone in their deathbed um, uh, regret the things that they have done 
they usually regret the things that they did not do. You know what I mean? Because you sit around and you take the easy way out, right? And you don't do the hard things or you, you know, whatever, you're petty and all that stuff. When you get to your end of life, the things that you haven't done is um, uh, is what's important. Now, I, you know, as a coach, I do something that's called your um, sitting at your funeral, right? So you sit at the back of your funeral and you hear people talking about you because that's what they do at a funeral, right? What are they going to say about you? So that's almost the same thing, but with a different little spin. This one talks to your character. And, um, you know, did you serve? Or were you selfish? And does anybody have anything good to say about you or they have to lie? Because, you know, the movies, if people go up there for eulogy and make stuff up. <laughs> Yeah. Because there's really nothing nice to say about the person that just died. But these are all things that you listeners, you know, we're trying to bring to your attention that, yes, um, uh, what are the things that are important to you in life? What do you want to be remembered by? What are you what are you leaving this earth when you die? You might think you have 50 years to do it, but, you know, tomorrow is not promised. So, yes, we're bringing this conversation to you because. Yes, you know, when you're making decisions, do the, the deathbed gut check. When you are being a, a nasty, mean person, <laughs> think about your funeral and, and what how, how do people feel about you? You know, you've seen the movies where there's nobody at a funeral, right? Yeah, nobody comes, right? And I think about that all the time. You know, what happens if I die? Who's going to come and and say, you know, she was a good person and and she, you know, um, influenced my life for the best and things like that. Because yes, I do live with, I told you, I started the conversation by saying, I practiced this, that you might die tomorrow. So I'm not sitting around saying I'm going to die at 96. <laughs> Even though yes. I pray that that's true. <laughs> I think you're immortal, Myrna. Any- we need you around forever. <laughs> thanks any circle back on that (laughs) oh goodness well yeah really I mean you gave the most perfect example about about you know you the the two people that you're mediating with and how the deathbed gut check would help them think about how they might respond and whether they decide to get mad or not and truly yeah that I use the deathbed gut check when I'm deciding whether to go to an event right like am I going to care about whether I went to this event or not when I die right and it's like if it's a family event Okay. Or, you know, whatever your particular value system is, when I'm struggling with how to respond to a text message, I'll think about the deathbed gut check and, and I'll weigh my response. And, and it, a lot of times it changes it and 99% of the time it changes it for the better. And that's the power of mortality awareness. That's the power of, because part of, uh, of, oh gosh, I can't remember the quote, but it's, there's an amazing quote out there. That's like the world's job is to to pick at us the world's job is to bring us down the world's job is to distract us and it's our job to keep our heart open and to uh to pursue personal growth and kindness and love and that's really hard and so the reality is that we are going to get distracted we are going to go on autopilot we are going to forget to look at the beauty of the world we are going to forget to open our hearts but as long as and for me, I set that as one of my values in life is this like this uh, process of of opening myself. And, and I think very clearly you do, too. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners are. And I would invite you to consider when we are working with personal growth, whether you are doing it because you don't like yourself and because you think that you are not enough or whether you're working on personal growth because you love yourself. And for me, when I first started exploring that, I realized I had some work to do. I was I was thinking that I wasn't enough. I was thinking that I needed to change this. And but but when I really started doing that practice of personal growth and self improvement, because I just I love myself and I have these you know high aspirations and I want to be more like God. That's where we can engage in this in a loving way, as opposed to a, a low self worth motivation. And, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, as we talk about all of this today, we talk Mm -hmm. about death, we talk about life and, you know, being alive really is a gift. 
isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Like I said, it was just this morning. <laughs> yeah. Just this morning because I'm also very soul conscious as well. And I'm, I'm very conscious of um, the body and the spirit. Right. And, um, you know, I'm very conscious of, of keeping the body, which is a temple for the spirit. I'm healthy, but I also know that I also need to communicate with my spirit and my soul and, and all that. So the breath is, is, is life, right? The breath is, you know, spirituality is the soul and, and yeah. So yeah. Once in a while I say, Hey, you, <laughs> you know, like, um, I think who was, who was the person that's saying, Oh, right. Michael Singer. One of his favorite words is, um, um, you in there, are you okay in there? Yeah. <laughs> hey, soul, what's up? What's up, girl? <laughs> yeah, are you okay? So, yes, I, 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 you know, when I'm doing my meditation is usually when I'm there, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to get that, um, that reminder app so that I can remember to do it like every hour or something. Awesome. All right. So, um, so what are some habits that you want to leave us with that we can cultivate to make sure that we're living like we will die tomorrow? Mm. Well, the one thing that I just want to leave people with is the idea that you can change the world and you can live your best life and your most fulfilled life and the life that you enjoy the most and the life that leaves the most positive legacy, right? Like we talked about your funeral and here's how you do it. You have fun. <laughs> and a lot of us don't want to admit that. And it sounds so frivolous, right? Like, Oh, have fun. Oh, enjoy your life. I have things to do. I have things I want to accomplish. I've got stuff going on, but thinking back to Dan, right? Dan, my friend who died on Everest, he did a lot of really cool things. He he worked at Google with me. He had a way cooler job than I did at Google. He climbed mountains. He had a really cool, uh, he started a side hustle. He opened up a co-working space in San Francisco. He started an, an environmental nonprofit called Save the Ice. He did a lot of really cool things. But I think, and I believe that, I don't think I would have noticed him doing those cool things if he didn't have such a dang good time while he was doing it, he's just one of those people that he had fun in whatever he did. He made things enjoyable. He had this, this spark about him. He would joke around. He would play pranks on people, just very good natured. And while the rest of us are sort of like, you know, oh, I, you know, I have to do this and I'm stressed <laughs> and this is what's going on. That's not, that's not leaving the legacy. So you can start a nonprofit that feeds a million kids great, do that. But if you really want to leave that positive legacy, you're going to enjoy yourself along the way amidst the setbacks, amidst the frustrations, amidst the, the wins and the successes. And so that's why I'm like, pursue your passions, write the book, start the nonprofit, work with underserved kids, you know, be active in your church group. Great. Do those things, but don't forget to enjoy the ride along the way. Because if you truly want to inspire people, like I do, right? I, I want to inspire people. I want people to remember me. I want to leave a lasting pos positive impact. The way we show up every single day is the absolute best way to do that. You can think of, think of someone in your life right now who they do cool things and they just seem to have a good time while they're doing it. And you really enjoy being around them. And you're inspired by the attitude that they show up to life with every single day. And now I encourage you to, to explore what that would look like for yourself. Maybe that's joking more. Maybe that's wearing clothes that maybe reflect your personality a little bit better. Maybe it's sending funny or loving notes and text messages to people on a more regular basis. Maybe it's playing pranks on your friends, good-natured pranks on your friends. But just explore. If you were to have a little bit more fun on a given day and lighten your emotional load so that you can accomplish great things but also have a great time in the process, uh, what might that look for yourself? And also remember that the way that we show up every single day is our greatest shot at changing the world <laughs> because we're going to impact. So, so the last thing I'll say on this is Dr. Irvin D. Loam is this incredible psychologist who wrote a book that changed my life called Staring at the Sun. 
And in that book, he talks about how in his decades, decades, decades of years as an existential psychologist, he encountered so many people who came to him with a fear of death. And what he found in his work was that the greatest antidote to the fear of death is the idea of rippling, which is the notion that whatever we're doing in any given day, we're constantly creating these ripples with the people that we meet at the corner store, with our friends and family, with our colleagues, with whomever, and even energetic ripples, right, that we can't even necessarily see or touch. And um, and so I think about the ripples that you're making with the people at the corner store and with your friends and family and, um, and know that um, it not only helps you fear death less, but it also is, like I said, your best shot at changing the world to create these ripples that will go far beyond that which you will ever be able to understand. They'll go on through generations, uh, your kindness and your light and your vulnerable and humble process of becoming the full and real you. Yeah, that's beautiful. You just reminded me that um, I had made the decision or intention is probably the better word that the next 10 years of my life is going to be the best 10 years of my life. And yes. I'm gonna have, <laughs> and I am going to have fun and adventure. So when we were talking about what's, what's on my deathbed, I couldn't really remember anything because, you know, I'm a coach. I do, you know, I'm, I, I live mindfully and I couldn't think of anything. But yeah, it wouldn't really bother me so much on my deathbed if I didn't have fun and adventure. But it's something for me to prioritize. So that's great. I think I told you that I um that I always wanted to go to India to an ashram and you know, you talk about your friend Dan that died on the on um on Everest. At one point in time, I, I wanted to hike not all the way to the top of Mount Everest, but I wanted to go at least to base camp because I've read books and I've watched movies and I'm so fascinated with people that want to climb Mount Everest. I would never want to do it, but I want to tell you that your friend Dan knew that there's a, there's a big possibility that he would never come back down, exactly. right? But they do it anyway, right? And I've, listen, I have, I'm so inspired by the people that go up to Mount Everest. <laughs> And it, it's 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 a personal challenge, and if you go up and come down, the whole world opens up for you. Everything, I've 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 heard about people climbing up Mount Everest and, and um, walking over dead people that are just frozen. You know what I mean? It is it is. I think I don't know if there's any challenge that's bigger than that, but I know that the people that do it they're aware that they can die and they're okay with that, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted all to do all these different things, but then, you know, um, you know, life and, and all these things come in your way and, and, and you, you may get, you have commitments, but yes, I, I have made, yes, you should have fun. You should do the things that make your heart sing. Right. And, um, and you enjoy life and you're just, you know, your aura is so beautiful because you're truly happy from the inside. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I said, are you okay in there? <laughs> is what's in here that's important and fun makes you okay in here. So that's 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 great advice and one that that I would I would definitely prioritize for myself, you know, uh, have fun and um do Enjoy things your life. You happy. What was that? Enjoy your life. Yeah. If we yes. forget everything that I said, yeah, just, mm -hmm. just remember that it, it truly, I believe that it's part of my life purpose. It's part of all of our life purpose to, mm -hmm. to enjoy our life. Uh, yes. you know, of course there's a lot of, I, I don't believe necessarily in one life purpose, but, but one of them is absolutely to enjoy our lives. And, um, and in that we can, we can impart such great change in the world, right. Yes. With that, with that energy of love and enjoyment, and mm -hmm. passion and you know mm -hmm. you want to do Everest and and India and all these things and that's one of the challenges of being a multi-passionate person like you are you're sure we have we have you know like you said commitments and things but yeah. but also you're so passionate and you're so vivacious and full of life that you probably couldn't possibly do all of the amazing things that you want to do in the hopefully 96 years that you get and so we just have to choose maybe I'll get it in there right? yeah yeah exactly <laughs> 
<laughs> That's amazing. Well, thanks for the encouragement. I love that. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your book. Um, what's it called? Um, you Might Die Tomorrow. Um, I think I understand why you wrote it, but if there's something that that um, there's a reason that you wrote it that you haven't mentioned yet. So, you know, what do you want the readers to walk away with um, after reading? And of course, where they can pick up a copy of your book and where they can get in touch with you, your social media and things like that. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And I'd love to connect with you. And if you'd like to get my book, it is called You Might Die Tomorrow. And it's available online wherever you get books. It's also an audio audiobook on Audible as well. If you'd like to listen to my voice for five and a half hours, I even sing on the audiobook for a moment. Nice. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, really, the You Might Die Tomorrow book is it goes more in depth into my story of, of awakening and the trip and leaving Google and, you know, what I learned when I got back, but it's also a psychological exploration of, of how mortality is this key to awakening and urgency in life. And, and it helps give you some tactical ways to, um, to invite mortality into your life. I also have a companion workbook to the book called the alive workbook also available on Amazon. And, uh, and that one has, uh, it's, it's a bigger focus on feeling alive and, and opening up to feeling free in our lives. Because I think a lot of us, we hold a lot of weight on ourselves of regrets and resentments and things that we did and didn't do and say, and the alive workbook is an opening process to release, to release that heaviness that we carry so that we can blossom fully into life. And then I also just came out with a children's book called You Might or called You Are the Cyan Ocean. And it's just a beautiful children's book illustrated actually by my sister. And it really helps kids who might uh, might have issues or or I mean, all of us will have issues in our lives with with loneliness, potentially bullying. It's it's a book about oneness and it, it talks about the interconnectedness of all of all living beings. And my website is katemanser.com and I'm on Instagram and TikTok. My handle is the alive Kate. And, uh, yeah, I would love to be connected with you. Drop me a, a message on Instagram or my website and keep listening to Myrna. She's got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Kate is starting her own podcast. She's just starting it, but yeah, but you know, if you connect with her on Instagram or, you know, um, get a copy of her book, then, um, yes. Then when she, um, when her podcast is it live yet, Kate? No, I'm I'm recording episodes now, but uh, okay. yeah, if you connect with me on Instagram, I will I will uh, announce a notification or make an announcement about the launch of the podcast. It's oh, called it's, Be Alive with Kate Manser. Right. Yes. 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 Awesome. Well, listen, Kate, this has been a wonderful conversation. I knew it was going to be with a topic like how to live like you're going to die tomorrow. And um, I think we, <laughs> I think we checked all the boxes in this conversation. This is a, a great conversation. So I appreciate um, you coming on the show and um, sharing this important message because yes, people go, people do um, go in autopilot. They live their lives. Like they've got a whole bunch of time. Like you said, they're going to live until they're 99 and they've got a whole bunch of time. Um, a lot of people put off having fun until they're like 65 and then they die a month before to become 65. You know, yeah. they want to retire and they don't get there. So yeah, um, uh, live every day that like it's going to be your last. So this is a really good message, a really good, um, uh, you know, topic to bring to people's awareness. Okay. Yes. Thank you for, for our conversation. Um, I'm going to have a transcript of my conversation with Kate, on the show page, which is blog.myhelps.us. And I will link out to her um, website and to her book. So just in case you didn't you didn't catch the name of it, then you can head over to the show page and um and link out to that. But yes, I mean this is this is something that you know we should all we should all keep to the forefront. And yes, I consume my books on Audible. So I will definitely um, uh, download um, uh, a copy of your book um, when I walk my 5K. That's what I'm doing. In your I'm sanctuary. Something is in my ear. 
yeah absolutely so, yes that's what fills me up and brings me joy um mm. a lot of joy there's one point in time i was listening i was listening to this um life story it was it was actually um, michael tyson's book and something happened where my headset wouldn't work and i recognized that that listening to, to stories and self-improvement books and all that stuff is level 10 joy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that's amazing. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you for tuning in to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life on radio, podcast, and television show. I love having these wonderful conversations. I learn, and I hope that you're learning too. It fills me up right to the brim. It gives me joy, right? So even if I were to die tomorrow, I'm doing something that I love right now today. So um, Kate, as we wrap up, any last words? Enjoy your life and thank you for being you. We need you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. You don't want to be anyone else. There's only one of you <laughs> and enjoy it. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, Kate. Thank you guys for tuning in. Until next time, namaste.